when you have a bunch of readers come together and work on some of those amazing lines, it's really magic. I would never admit it. <laughs> I think I like ambiguity, and I like the thing that I like teaching Shakespeare, and the thing that I found about out about myself along the way is that I thought I was somebody. You know, I'm a cultural studies person, and so I really do want to take apart the Shakespeare that is prepackaged, that has a lot of um, overblown signification. But I really do love those aesthetic, <laughs> rewarding parts of those plays. I think they're fun to teach. In a way, it's it's a it's a more sophisticated comedy than *Midsummer Night's Dream*. It's a it's also a witty comedy. It's a comedy that's a involves a lot of play on words. It's less about situational comedy and a lot more about language play. And so, in a way, it's difficult because the language doesn't hug you. The language actually challenges you. I do much wonder that one man seeing how much another man is a fool when he dedicates his behaviors to love, will, after he hath laughed at such shallow follies and others, become the argument of his own scorn by falling in love. I mean, such a man as Claudio, he's over here. I have known when there was no music with him but the drum and the fife. And now had he rather hear the tabor and the pipe. I have known when he would have walked ten mile afoot to see a good armor. And now will he lie ten nights awake carving the fashion of a new doublet. Yes, it looks like just banter, but you look at it more and go, that's banter with a purpose, and there's some, there's some hidden pain there. Muddled up with that, aligned with that, is the healthy understanding that very often quick, instant, self-feeding romantic love is simplistic to the point of dishonesty. What I like about these two is they're, they've sort of, they've given up on love. They're not uh, morose about it. They're not bitter about it. They, they're quite comfortable in, this, in their skins and, and in the role they play in, in, this, in this life, in this play. And uh, so when, when this relationship between Beatrice and Benedict reveals itself at the beginning, they've already had a history, as David and I do. And at some point in the, pl in the play, they metaphorically turn to each other and look at each other anew. I didn't know that's who you were. That's who you are. And they, it's really a, a moment of rebirth. It's a wonderful poetic moment. And it takes a while, it's not just a moment. There are layers. Of, one of the things about Shakespeare is that he Once. writes in layers and layers and layers and layers. The deeper you want to look, there's another layer, there's another layer. It's in some of the smaller moments in, in uh, the plays that are much more beautiful. And, you know, we're always drawn to look at the title characters of the, of the plays. And I, I would say, look at the, the more minor characters. Look at the priest in Romeo and Juliet. Look, uh, you know, look at the, not the speaker of the sonnets, but who's receiving the sonnets and who they're addressed to. Early in Much Do About Nothing, Shakespeare has Benedict and Beatrice have this little battle of wits, their, their first in-person sparring. Um, we actually get a preview of it a little bit earlier when Beatrice first asks about Benedict, you have a sense of what's to come. Um, but they have this battle of wits, this little bit of a, a fight in, in front of everyone, and Benedict ends it by just throwing up his hands and being like, I have done, and he goes off, and Beatrice is left alone being kind of laughed at, and she says, you always end with a jade's trick, I know you of old. And in that one line, she's saying, you always end with this cheap shot. And in this case, it was just throwing up his hands and being like, oh, I'm done, not giving her an opportunity to keep talking. Um, and she's saying she's really familiar with his tricks. She knows exactly what he's doing. And she's frustrated with herself because she hasn't learned better at this point. She hasn't figured out how to defend herself against it. But she is out of patience with him. Um, she's done. <laughs> and, um, and she wanted to get that last shot. How I always like to read it is that she could have had him, but he wasn't willing to let her have a chance. So he just, his jade's trick, and just opted out. And the funny thing is she's frustrated because she didn't get the last word, but he's got the last word speaking to the characters on stage. She has the last word speaking to the audience. 
we have this sense of Shakespeare being this 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 huge cultural icon. This these plays are about nation building. These plays are about love. These plays are about death. These plays are about families, and we have these rich, complex characters, female characters specifically, that challenge some of our assumptions about women's roles in all of those matters. For better or worse, they're not, some of them are easy to like, others are more difficult. <laughs> Even though these women are, you know, situation, situationally really gendered and they have a lot of things with like being mothers and being wives, he brings uh, a lot of power to that place. And I think that's a really important thing to look at when you're discussing like women in Shakespeare. As a woman, as, as a young woman growing up, I did not, of course, like being told that these are the roles I'm supposed to fit into. I grew up in a religious home where I was told children are meant to obey their parents and, hus and wives are meant to honor their husbands. And I thought, well, there should be more to life than that. And so Shakespeare's characters, his women characters, really provided an example of that for me. I think one of the things that at my age, I, I'm appreciating about Beatrice is that she is past her prime in that culture. Um, she's sort of off the market. But she decides during the play to reclaim her womanhood in every way that that she, I think she's a feminist. I mean, she absolutely is a feminist. She at one point says, um, her uncle asks, her uncle says, oh, I hope to see you one day fitted with a husband. And she says, not till God make man of some other metal than earth. Would it not grieve a woman to be overmastered by a piece of valiant dust? To make an account of her life to a, a clod of wayward moral? No uncle, I'll none. So I'm gonna be overruled by a piece of dust, by a piece of clay who's no better than I am? No, thank you. I think she, what she's saying inherently in that is that they're my equals. I'm not going to be overmastered by one of these clowns. Beatrice, ugh, I love Beatrice because she's not that young and she's not that foolish. And you know the scene where she she talks about the wound that's been done to her friend that can't be undone, that has cost her her life, her social life, and you know she turns to Benedict and she says, you know. Oh, if I were a man, I would eat his heart in the marketplace. God, I love her. I mean, it's horrible. It's violent. It's exactly what I'm saying Romeo and Juliet is such an interesting play for because it forces you to think through those violence. But the, it's so rare that you see in early modern drama or early modern literature that kind of sense of loyalty between women and that's that real sense of understanding of exactly what's happened to her friend um, and her attempt to, to convince Benedict to see that wrong. It makes that such a great scene and her such a great character. Beatrice is a uh, quite brave and courageous stance on social issues. Uh, and, you know, you think of feminism as being a 19th century, but it was way earlier than that. that uh, so Shakespeare put in the mouth of Beatrice a pretty strong sense of the, of the wicked lot that women had drawn. Oh, to be a man, on that entire speech, for me, when I first heard that the first time, I felt like a, a feminist. Does that sound so silly? I felt like, oh my God, she's a feminist. She understands that they just don't get that we have to concede our power you know, all the time, that we have to give way because we can't say that's not fair, that's not right, that's not just. I mean, we can, we can now, sometimes. Beatrice kind of comes back to match everything that Benedict says and every witty little comment or insult that he gives her. She comes back at it with as much fervor as he does. And I love seeing women represented that way at a time when that wasn't the norm. Beatrice is this young woman and she's very, she has a very fiery spirit. She's very passionate in everything she says. She's very, very witty. She has a joke for almost every situation and she's very strongly protective of her family, especially Hero, her cousin. 
what I love about Beatrice is she's able to see her own errors and then to change her behavior in order to fit with those new observations that she's getting about herself and I, I hope to be someone who can do that um, along with being very spunky. I just love her. I think she's so strong. I love that through most of the play she speaks in prose then at her most emotional, she speaks in verse. At the most emotional, when I, Colleen Madden, I would splutter and curse and, you know, gnash my teeth, um, tear my hair. He has people at their most emotional. They all of a sudden get really condensed and complex and soft. I mean, I really did not have a diet of Shakespeare until I decided I want to be an actress. And um, I went to this classical theater training program. God knows why they took me, but uh, I ha it was just a baptism by fire. So I was enamored of this thing called Shakespeare, this greater than life thing that I'd seen in Germany. I come to England and I'm studying it with a professor and I'm reading these words and I'm just, so taken by the language and Much Ado was one of the first shows I ever saw Shakespeare in English. And so I got to see it in Stratford and I'm reading this play and studying this play. I'm just, this is incredible the way he's putting this. This guy's really good. And I'm 18, 19 at the time. This guy's really good. Look at this. They should teach this in school. It's really smart stuff. And I was totally enamored. And then you get to see the show and I'm understanding it. And now I get to see an actor speak these words and, and twist these words that I love on the page and give them life up here in the size and the scope. And I was just, oh, this is fantastic. And then afterwards at the pub, I'm meeting him and they're, they're workmen. They're blue collar workmen because I was a poor white trash kid in Virginia growing up. And this was all star studded stuff for me. And these guys are working class guys. And for them, Shakespeare is a job. It's a pipe wrench with a, with a fitting, and it's this, and no, that's not working. Let me see what, ah, that's not the right side. Ah, there we go. And you watch a play, and it starts to rain, or the sun comes out, or the moon starts to go down, and it's just this experience of an entire audience leaning forward and completely engaged by what is happening on that stage. And it's, it's brilliant. All those distractions, like the birds that you hear, kind of go away after a while, and then they come back out at the right moment and the actors use it. So I think we are in the theater to connect and I think that as a young person I thought that, you know, this walking around is all of these nerve endings that we have that we really are looking for a place to, to have them make sense, you know? And when I found the theater I realized that, that was, that's what I was looking for. I was looking for this way to, to, to make this existence make sense. He offers his arm to Beatrice their first date and he goes, oh no, no, you don't know it. And she takes his arm and both of them just kind of stop and it just, it's the first time they knowingly touch each other. And it's, and our audiences, they just go, oh, oh. And it's just her hand putting her on my arm. And it's, you would think it was some, one of the most raciest things you'd ever seen on the stage out here. Shakespeare's audience was incredibly dynamic. Uh, the the audience-actor relationship was much more dynamic than we have in theaters today. Uh, audience members would be standing, talking back to the uh, actors on stage, they would be eating, perhaps lobbying vegetables uh, at their actors if they were unsatisfied or dissatisfied with the performance. So it was a very different social experience going to the theater. It was definitely a more interactive one than we think of now when we go into a theater and we're sort of socially trained to sit quietly and the lights go down and we watch something um, by ourselves in a communal space. I think there's something really important about sitting with other human beings in a theater, receiving an idea, receiving story, receiving poetry, and you're all processing these things differently, individually, but you're literally sharing the same air.